I'd like to share the story of a woman who came to a Designing Your Life for Women retreat about a year and a half ago. So one of the things that she had been for a long time thinking about was how to have an impact in her community. She cares deeply about the, the area in which she lives. Um, she lives in Carlsbad County in Southern California and was really feeling the need to serve her community better. And in her three Odyssey plans, one of them included running for office. And when she shared those plans with her colleagues at the retreat, she was lit up. She was excited. She cared deeply about the work she was doing and she was fired up. And they noticed that and they reflected that back to her. And afterward, we debriefed the whole experience. And she said, yes, you know, the other women in my triad, they mentioned that I was really fired up about this. And we asked her, what's stopping you? And she said, well, frankly, the fundraising aspect, I have lots of ideas about policy. I really believe that our community can be well served by doing some particular things, but the idea of raising money for a campaign feels very daunting. And in that moment, another woman got up and handed her $5 and said, let me be the first to contribute to your campaign. And so Lena Panagaitis is now running for office in Carlsbad County. And there was this moment where she realized that she could do this and she's now doing it. And I think that's the power of radical collaboration and the, the process of unearthing where you're fired up, where you want to serve your community, and then having people around you affirm you in doing those things. Hi. My name is Aran Dror, and this is Remake, a podcast about design systems and society. In each episode, I talk to someone who's trying to change our lives for the better in some meaningful way, whether through a new product, new venture, or new way of looking at the world. And I try to understand how they came to it, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from them. Today, I'm talking to Kathy Davis. Kathy wears many hats. She's a design lecturer at Stanford University and managing director at the Stanford Life Design Lab. She and her team have trained 150 universities globally to use the life design process on campuses to help students design, prototype, and test the right career paths for them. She's also a co-founder and CEO at DYL Consulting, that's Design Your Life Consulting, where she uses design thinking and life design principles to build a better world. In her previous life, Kathy was also an engineer in Silicon Valley, focused on transformative tech like Internet of Things and medical devices. So let's jump right in with Kathy Davis. Uh, so uh, I'm sitting across the screen from Kathy Davis. Kathy, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and so I guess the first question before I, I go into the more podcasty thing is to ask, you know, how are you doing these days? What's the situation where you are? How are you processing what's going on? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that's the first question that's on all of our minds these days. Um, I'm doing all right. I, um, a friend of mine says, um, I can't complain, but I, but I really want to, <laughs> and I think that's a perfect answer. Um, I'm here in the Bay area. Um, right now is an interesting time because we have the collision of the pandemic and also the fires mm. that are now under much better control, but continue to burn and continue to affect the air quality. So not only are we inside and, um, physically distanced from folks, due to the COVID situation, but we also now really can't go outside very easily because the air quality is quite poor. Mm. So that for me as someone who really gets a lot of energy from going outside and taking hikes and being in nature um, has actually been strangely almost more difficult than uh, COVID itself mm. in, in some ways. Obviously uh, less broad reaching, but certainly um, just on, on, on a local level has, has a high impact. So we're hanging in there. I've got two daughters, 14 and 12, who are mm -hmm. home doing school upstairs. Um, and my partner is also a high school teacher. So he's upstairs <laughs> doing uh, teaching. And so um, we're very fortunate that we have the ability to do that and that we have a place that's, that's at least at this time safe. And right. um, so I keep reminding myself of that. And the bandwidth, which must be... Uh... 
you we know. had to upgrade. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm very fortunate that I was able to do that because that's not available everywhere, and and yeah. not everyone is financially able to do that. So I do count that as as a blessing for sure. For sure, I I now have two separate internet connections at home, just like a, a DSL and a, and the cable, just so that I can n- never lose connection to the outside world. Yeah. Um, so um, so it's good to hear that you're you know. You can't complain, but you'd like to. Uh, <laughs> I, I think this is a, this is the bet. This is the better part of the uh, of the scope of this. Uh, yeah. So, but um, so, but the fires. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand because I've read a little bit about the fires in California. But is it, does it actually affect life? Uh, where you live, where you can't go outside to nature, or you know, what's the? Yes, absolutely. So the oh. fires. Um, well, there were 12,000 lightning strikes uh, several weekends back that started all of these fires uh, and that, that hit ground. So what that meant was uh, multiple small fires started in a wide variety of places around the Bay Area. But the three main fires were the CZU fire, which is burned through sort of Santa Cruz Mountains, the Ellen New fire, the largest fire and the most destructive, and that's north of where we are up in the Vallejo, um, Vacaville, um, north of the Bay Area, and then the CSU fire, which is east, and that has burned over 300,000 acres of wilderness, um, almost directly east and south of us. So the CSU fire initially was the fire that I think was affecting our air quality here in Fremont most strongly initially, um, but the LNU fire also, the, because the winds tend to blow south, also affected our air quality quite uh, quite a lot. And wow. And just the the loss of structures in life. I mean, the the fifteen hundred structures in the LNU, I believe, and a similar number in the CZU. So quite a lot of um, certainly um, livestock and animals, and also um, just property destruction and, and a few folks. But I think for the most part, people were able to evacu- evacuate. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I actually didn't realize it was that bad. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, three hundred thousand acres, and yeah. right. It's um, it was a really unusual situation. So the the dry lightning strikes very rare. We don't have that very often here, and certainly in that in those numbers, no. it was it was um, it was startling. We were awakened because it happened in the in the um, late night, early morning. We were awakened by the sound of the thunder. It was it was wow. quite um, quite a, quite amazing, actually, in terms of just the power of nature. Wow! What a, what a year this is. We have been joking be. in the Bay Area that the next thing is probably locusts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, yeah, uh, it, yeah. We got two down. So, um, wow. Uh, so. Um, Hopefully everything is kind of is is going to be under control uh, soon, and and at some point the rains will also probably help with this. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. um, holding uh, my fingers crossed. Um, Thank you. Now, in terms of the corona, I think that has a more um, maybe a deeper effect on work, uh, right? Then indeed. <laughs> and indeed. So. so you know, if you can, before we kind of dive into the chronology and all that stuff, if, if you could just maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, how do you think of what you do today? And then how do you think about the way it's changing now and the challenges involved? Oh, that's a big question. I typically teach classes at Stanford in a room, uh, typically between 50 and 100 students. And it's a highly interactive in-person experience. And we move around a lot, um, stand up, sit down, move our chairs, um, do things on the wall because ideating standing up is a great way to just get the creative juices flowing. Mm. And I work with a team and we spend a lot of time together, physically together, working on our curriculum, and then of course, delivering classes together. And in addition, Susan and I deliver workshops in the world for DYL consulting, specifically workshops for women and also intensive workshops for uh, co-ed groups and Mm -hmm. for companies. And all of those also happen in person and are highly hands-on. So the experience of locking down was a a really big change for what I do because what we do is so interactive and has so much been about really the people 
Right. And so the challenge then was, can we do this virtually? And to be honest, I wasn't sure that we could. I, uh, my colleagues, I think, were much more optimistic than I at Stanford. And I'm, I'm so grateful to them because uh, we had to make the transition in a matter of weeks, as, as did all the educators in the world who were trying to serve students ages K through, uh, you know, whatever right. age they're working with, adult mm -hmm. learners. So... Uh, yeah, now we're doing it like this, like you and I are talking and yeah. it has been actually remarkably successful, which I, I wouldn't have predicted. I think the thing that has happened now is now we are really thinking pedagogically about how to vary an energy, not by changing body position, but by changing activity, mm. by having individual learners be able to uh, do some assessment or some reflection quietly off screen. So actually writing with, you know, <laughs> pen and paper, old yeah. school, uh, and then talking in pairs and breakout rooms and in small groups and breakout rooms and then leveraging some of the technology chat uh, in particular has been great because what that allows people to do is everyone can contribute. And in an in-person classroom, you call on one or two or three people and then you move on. But in the chat, everyone can share their thoughts and mm. everyone can read everyone else's thoughts. And so that's actually been a tremendous gift yeah. to the work we do. So yeah, in some up. ways it's better, right? Uh, and that's been a big learning for us is, is just, okay, how can we, now if we go back into the in-person space, which I'm excited to do, how can we gather that same kind of full group participation? Mm. And what would that look like to mash it up or even to use something like chat when we're together? Yeah. And so I think it's opened up a whole new space of opportunity, quite frankly, um, while at the same time being a, a bit of a process of grieving that we can't be together. Yeah. Um, so kind of a mixed bag, I guess. Yeah, it's, 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 it feels like that to me as well. I feel like... Um, like we can solve relatively easy, easily for the productive stuff. Like we actually can get things done online. But what's missing for me still, and, and I think really requires a lot of thinking and, cre and product creativity and, um, and design is to bring the fun of, of, uh, an inter of a real you know, in-person event, because that's the hardest thing. And even in this conversation, you know, if we were having it in real life with a, um, a glass of beer or, you know, that would have felt very differently uh, than like a little square on the screen. Yeah. Uh, and I have to have, I have to have my notes on the screen as well. So I have, it's even smaller. Uh, but um, it was interesting what you said. Um, I have so many thoughts about what you said, but the, um, so you said by varying the activities, you introduce the energy. Mm -hmm. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about that? That's yeah, pretty... absolutely. Pedagogically, we are terrible. <laughs> Students are terrible. And by really definition, humans have gotten, I think, quite a bit worse in the last 50 years as technology has empowered a lot of code switching and a lot of multitasking. We're getting a lot worse at paying attention. And so what that means is if I decide as a lecturer, oh, I'm going to just tell you everything I know for a long time, what will happen is for the first few minutes, you're kind of engaged and you're nodding along and then your attention starts to drift. Yeah. And then, especially since we're on screen, you might notice, oh, I had got a new email, right? And because we're just here on screen, you're like, click, click, click. I'm just going to just change windows for a second. I'm still listening. <laughs> Especially if it's a multi-party meeting where I'm not right. being, you know, at the center. Exactly. Of it. You know? Exactly. If it's a multi-party meeting where you're not, where you're not actively contributing, your thought is, well, you know, this isn't hurting anyone. And I'm, and I'm just being a little bit more productive. Mm. And in one way, that's true because you actually, now you did answer that email and, and that's off your plate. And for a lot of us, too much email is a problem, mm. but you also then aren't as engaged in the material and probably you won't remember some of the things that happened during that time that you were writing an email because in fact, our brains don't do two things at once. We actually switch between tasks. And so that means at the time that you were actively writing, you were not actually present. And so in our, in our curriculum design, we think a lot about, okay, you get about five minutes to, to talk. Mm. 
And then we've got to say, okay, try something yourself right now. Get out your pen, get out your paper, build this thing, whatever it is. Think about this topic, jot down some thoughts. All right, now we're putting you in pairs. And if you're in a pair, there's nowhere to go, right? You have to actually interact with the person. Um, And then those pairs go into groups of six and there's more sharing of insights and then to the full group and then the full chat. So it's actually a quite... um, uh, quite a consistent progression that we're tending to use in our classes now. And each of those spans of time is relatively short. And certainly the part where we're, we're just talking is relatively short because we know everyone's attention wanders, especially on screen. Yeah. Interesting. Um, that, that really um, makes me want to try some things, but, um, but I think, uh, I think it's definitely interesting to think about how to bring uh, the stuff that works from the webinars into real life. Um, I've done something like this um, that worked really well. Um, I had a, um, this was before even Corona, but I brought WhatsApp into like a big event. There were like 150 people in the audience and I had the barcode on the screen. And, it's, and I also send it in advance, but anybody who wants to contribute during the talk, scan the barcode. And uh, WhatsApp is super, super popular here. So everybody just scans the barcode and they can participate. So I ask questions and kind of give exercises and people write in chat. And it was oh, phenomenal. Great. People were writing just like hundreds of messages and, and, some, and it was funny and it was engaging. Um, and so that's definitely, I think that's the future of, of live events too, is that we're definitely going to bring some more of that. Yeah. There's um, been a bunch of research at Stanford and one of my colleagues, we've, we spend a fair amount of time talking about, about pedagogy. And one of my colleagues said the measure of how a student feels about an event or about a class, and in a way classes are events at this point, um, mm. is how much they feel heard. Mm. And so, and you think about that, right? Here in the time of COVID, we have the interactions that we have within our own physical structures. And perhaps we have a pod of people that we interact with, but what we've lost is all of the incidental interaction. Yeah. We're, we're no longer standing in the coffee line and noticing somebody's shoes or um, chatting with the barista or having that just brush past of somebody that we didn't expect to see on campus mm-hmm. or in our office. The, hey, how was your weekend? with the person that we don't know well. And as a result, all of those loose ties that are so critical in our thriving are missing. Yeah. And that just leads to a feeling of being unseen. And so if we can in our events, in our classes, in just the interactions we have, give people more opportunities to be seen during this time and heard during this time, I think that's what we all need a little bit in our hearts. So. Um, we're thinking a lot about that as in, in both at Stanford and also in the DYL consulting world that Susan and I are, uh, wow. are working on. Yeah, I, I totally important. resonate with that. That's so powerful. Um, we all want to be heard and seen. And, and you know, when you, when you um, even gesture at that, when you even just say, okay, I want to please write down your ideas for this. And then you just call out a couple of people, right? but you let them participate. Um, you know, it's, it's great. Um, great. So I, I want to do now the kind of our traditional opening for a conversation, um, which, which is, I try to connect and you're probably appreciated because, because this is what you do, but I try to connect what you do with who you are, uh, as a person and have been. And so uh, the question that, that I came up with to kind of start this, uh, discovery is to ask what's something you've discovered or learned early in life or in childhood that is still present and still drives you today? And you can take your time because it's a big, big question um, to see if you can find something that is kind of like, has been there all these years. Yeah, I have two things, I think, that come to mind. Um, One of them is pretty light and one of them is maybe a little bit not darker, but a little bit more uh, deeply connected to who I am. But uh, the first one is not too long ago, my parents were cleaning out their garage and they gave me uh, a raft of stuff that they had saved from my childhood. And so I've been going through this stuff. And one of the things that I found was one of those all about me books. 
that you write when you're a kid. And one of the questions, of course, is always, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the, the answer I had written, and I was about seven, I think. So I was in, you know, first grade, second grade, something like that. Uh, what I wrote was, when I grow up, I will be an artist and a scientist. <laughs> and I'm a product designer. <laughs> Which is exactly the meaning. So that's place. what that is. So yeah. I think that there was always this interest, the deep interest in art. Um, and my whole family is, is in science. So my father is a geologist and physicist. My oh. mother is an amateur uh, botanist and just deeply engaged with the natural world. And my sister is a PhD um, in microbiology and my brother is a geneticist. So like the, there's a pretty strong science bent yeah, yeah. In, our, in, our, in, our, in our family. My brother's now gone on to be a software engineer in addition to being a PhD in genetics. So, no. um, so this is a pretty sciencey crew. And so I'd say that is deeply embedded in how I think, just my problem solving te techniques. Um, on the more personal side, I was also a very weird kid. Uh, I came from this family of scientists and I wasn't very socially adept to put it in the nicest possible way. Um, and what that meant was there was a period of time where I really had very few friends. I went to a private a Montessori school when I was little, mm. uh, which was a work at your own pace school. It was an experimental school and there were only 12 students. It grew a little bit, but there were no girls my age. Mm. And so there was a period of time where I really didn't have anyone who was an age peer and a gender peer. And I was also incredibly introverted and spent most of my time reading. So I didn't develop social skills either. I, I think my, my feeling was that somehow, like in some of these books, someone would just come and become my friend <laughs> <laughs> with no work on my part whatsoever. Uh, and then I went into public school and I was academically advanced, but socially quite behind. Mm. And again, my, my friend making skills consisted of sitting in a corner um, reading. So that really was zero. And as a result, uh, people made fun of me a lot because I was very odd. Uh, and I was also very competitive. So not only was I odd, but I was like in your face odd. I wasn't a fly under the radar odd. <laughs> Okay. Um, Some of my best friends. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I'll, I share that because I think that as a result, I was reflecting on this actually quite recently because, um, because of that, I, I think that there's a lot of understanding or empathy for sort of the folks who are maybe a little more on the margins mm -hmm. and also a deep seated desire to be part of community and to be doing work in community because there was a period of time where I was very lonely, where I felt like and in, in COVID, this is what was making me reflect on it. Just this idea of loneliness or being separated from community mm. and recognizing it from my youth and feeling this is part of what I'm about is connecting people in community to have these kinds of conversations that can help them um, to both make decisions in their lives, um, to build together things that they think need doing in the world, to have impact, um, and also just to be healthy and happy and thriving yeah. in, in and of themselves. Um, yeah. Because I think that's something that I really need. This, that's really interesting. So there's this, this aspect of um, connecting to other people uh, that's a big mm -hmm. part of your job now and, uh, and yeah. helping them feel like they're connected to the world through their work and through, you know, the decisions they make. Um, and, um, and in a way it's the good kind of fitting in because it's the fitting in that comes from inside that comes from like, okay, what do I want? What are my values? And then going and finding that place in the world. Right. Um, right. So that must be very satisfying. That really brought to mind this idea of radical collaboration, right? It's the good kind of fitting in. It's the kind of getting together with others, sharing ideas that you're all interested in, and then doing something about something that matters to you all. And I do think that that's the only way forward. Yeah. I don't think we can get out of some of the problems that we have built as a, as a world without folks really working together across difference. Yeah. 
and and when you're you know um i was um also a, a kind of a weird kid um and uh and that's good like that's in in the world of finding your passion and finding your work the fact that you're interested in things that are not you know um every day or not everybody shares is a good thing it's a clue it helps you find your kind of people and your kind of work um so it's definitely good. i i remember <laughs> Um, to share a personal story. Uh, so my father told me, he was very young, um, he came to pick me up from kindergarten and I was like red and crying and like, apparently what happened was I was fighting with all the other kids uh, because I told them about, uh, there used to be this big hairy elephant called a mammoth and and they didn't believe me and they laughed at me and they thought I was crazy. And I was like, no, there is, my dad there told is. me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, but then, you know, there, there used to be, like, I was right. right. And, uh, you were and right. You, and you find, um, you know, you find out that not always fitting in is actually, or, or not fitting in in every situation and not kind of suppressing what you know and what you feel in order to fit in is a good thing over, overall and over time. And then as a parent, I'm, I'm raising two wonderful daughters. And sometimes you notice that the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree. So uh, my one daughter, this was when she was in about first grade or, or second grade. We were having a discussion about Disney movies. And she said, Mom, don't you love Snow White? And I said... Well, no, not really. I think Snow White wasn't all that smart. You know, she, 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 they said, don't open the door. She opened it three different times. You know, it's clear that this witch was after her. You know, then there's the weird part about the prince kissing the dead prince. Like, there's just a lot mm. of things about that movie that, that concern me. Mm. Um, so a couple weeks later, I get a call from another mom in the, in the school. And she said, you know, I need to talk to you about, about Laurel. And I said, oh, well, what's going on? She said, well, she really made my daughter feel bad. And I said, oh, no, you know, what's happened? She said, well, my daughter really likes Snow White. And her daughter <laughs> said Snow White was stupid and then went off on a whole tangent. <laughs> Snow White made a lot of bad decisions. That's really funny. And I didn't quite know what to say because obviously it was not good that my daughter had made her daughter feel bad. And I obviously agreed that Snow White didn't make good decisions. And it was this funny moment of having to have a conversation with my daughter about the difference between being right and being kind and how mm. those aren't always the same thing. Mm. And yeah. And, and I, frankly, I still struggle with that. I'll get into arguments with people and I'll realize this argument isn't worth it. I could be right or I might not be right, but the damage to the relationship probably isn't worth either of those results. <laughs> yeah. But I think that that's, that's difficult to explain or to even understand when you're a kid. And certainly I did not understand that when I was a kid, that was part of my weirdness was I was willing to wade into every argument with like guns blazing. Yeah. <laughs> I would have fought to the death about the mammoth, just like you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was the same for most of my young life. Yeah. Definitely the first part of my life. Um, it's, it's really interesting. Um, so, uh, I have so many things. I, I, I just wanted to throw out there that like, you know, this um, uh, core principle in Buddhism that really affected me is like the, the idea of, of right speech. And right mm -hmm. speech is not necessarily true speech because it, it, has, it has two criteria. It has to be true and useful, beneficial. Right. So if, if you can cause a lot of damage with the truth in the wrong moment, right? And so just thinking, is this actually useful to say it right now? Um, and it's definitely something that I strive for, but am often falling short. Uh, mm -hmm. And when something is clearly true, but like it's not necessarily the smart thing to say. Um, Thank you so. for that. I actually really like that framing, and I think it's one that would benefit me also. Thank it's, you. Um, Thank you. Thank you for triggering the the thought. Uh, so, so continue on from there. So you you're. Um, a young person who wants to be an artist and a scientist and um, and has very strong views on things. Uh, and so um, you start, do you start with engineering? Do you first gravitate towards engineering? 
Yes, and uh, funny story. I went to Brown as an undergrad, and the the way it works at Brown, you have to choose a. Uh, or at that time, this is back in the day, so I don't know if this is still true. Hmm. But back in the day, you had to choose sort of a core class that you were going to take as your, as sort of as your grounding class as a freshman. And engineers were required to take, or are told to take an, an engineering core class. And I chose to take an art class instead, nice. um, which then resulted in sort of jacking up my schedule. But I, I did uh, join the en- engineering core as well uh, in order... To, be, to not close that option. And then I, I so I really enjoyed the art class, uh, but then the engineering requirements were so large that I ended up moving in that direction, mainly because I didn't want to give it up. Uh, I hadn't really chosen into it in wanting to give up art, mm. but I was afraid to give up engineering. And I was good at it and I, and I liked it. And so I continued through my four years. Although I will say that at the end of my freshman year, there was a moment where um, in a fit of like, I'm not going to do this anymore. I sold back my engineering <laughs> three textbook <laughs> to the, to the bookstore, uh, you know, in a, uh, raging against the machine. But I, I did, I did stick it out and, and ended up getting my degree in biomedical engineering with an emphasis in biomechanics. And, mm. um, but then later got more interested in this intersection between biology and engineering. Wow. That's really interesting. And, and engineering is also a kind of, it has a component of creativity uh, and it has a component of science. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might, might be a little bit more related, more closer to science than to art, uh, but it has both in, in a way that a designer does. Um, and so, and you seem to have done a lot of really interesting uh, projects in the engineering, uh, in the engineering part of your life. Um, what's something that's kind of super memorable or super meaningful to you in that period? Oh, oh golly. Um, I think memorable, probably we had a project that was about evacuating poor odors from the toilet tank, which was codenamed the fart fan. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) Uh, I also worked on uh, an internet appliance before everything could be done on your laptop. There was a a short period where folks were building these internet appliances that would Mm. go into your home uh, and wouldn't require a computer. And one of the early ones was an internet radio. And I worked with this startup called Curbango Mm. as a consultant. And I didn't even even start as as an engineer. I spent a couple years, and this is, I think, connected to where I am now. I spent a couple years right after college teaching high school physics because I didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> That's awesome. And somebody said, oh, they always hire women science teachers. Um, and so I did that. And that, I think, informs the arc 25 years later. Now here I am again in the classroom. And so obviously there's something about that process of teaching or interacting with other learners um, that I like and that yeah. somehow is fulfilling I think it connects to the community bit. Now that I now that I hear myself say that, I think it is the the doing things in community. Yeah, um, it's, it's and it involves people. So, how did you first get involved with design, design thinking? Uh, I'm assuming it wasn't straight into life design. Uh, it, it no. Started with okay. So. Yeah, I didn't go straight into life design. So I spent. Four years in undergrad, then I spent two years teaching high school physics at a boarding school on the East Coast. And at that point in time, I had, I think, the at least the wisdom to recognize that I wasn't doing that as well as I would like. And part of the reason was I didn't, I couldn't yet separate what was mine to control and what was the students to control. So, uh, and by that, I mean, I would teach a class, I'd think, wow, that was the greatest class. And then some students would be distracted and they wouldn't do the homework. And then I'd feel like, oh, maybe that was something that wrong with what I did and not giving them the agency that actually, you know, whether they chose to do the homework or not, that's really their choice. And that may have to do with whether I did a good job or that may have to do with the fact that there's a dance coming up and they're more interested in talking to their friends about that. Um, And, and also recognizing that in fact, some of the students were going to really resonate with me and some of them weren't going to. And, um, and I can continue to work on becoming a better teacher, uh, but that that was going to take time. So I, I got a little bit, um, I don't know if disillusioned is the right word, but I decided that I was going to try something else. And so I had in 
the time that I was at Brown, met some folks who were product designers. They had a product design firm in in Rhode Island and um, in Providence, and I had gone and tried to get a job there. <laughs> That's a whole other story about how poorly I interviewed. It was disastrous. <laughs> At one point, I was yeah. 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 Oh, it's a great story. Uh, but the yeah. the um, the the seed was planted at that time that product design was a thing and that it was something that I might be interested in. And it was this again this fusion of engineering and art. And so the folks who had run that uh, had mentioned the Stanford product design program actually in a in a pretty um, like that's a program, but that's not what you should do kind of way. You should go to a real art school if you really want to learn design. Mm. But um, something about that really appealed to me because I didn't have the art training and I didn't think I could get into art school. I thought, well, gee, you know, this guy mentioned that wasn't a real design program, but it was an engineering program and I could potentially fit there. So I, uh, did some research. I decided that in order to get in, I was going to need better art stuff. So I took a bunch of classes at the high school where I was teaching. I asked the other teachers if I could sit in, which I think was, they found really weird, but I thought it was fabulous. Um, and, uh, and then I created a portfolio, which, you know, such as it was of things that I had done both engineering and art and I sent it off. And then I got into the product design program at Stanford. And I would say that's where, truly my engagement with design as I teach it and as I, as I use it today professionally started. So yeah. the design thinking process, the process of really getting in the shop and building things. I was later a TA in the machine shop. The, all of that stuff formed during those years of graduate school, I would say. Wow. And it, it seems like Stanford is really the center of this whole design thinking movement. <laughs> and was that, were you there with, because that's where, I mean, that's where it all comes from, from the design school. Uh, were you there with David Kelly and with IDEO folks? And uh, I was, I was. And I actually spent a summer um, and then uh, uh, the following school year working at IDEO as an intern yeah. and, and, and did spend time with David Kelly. He was, the, there were a, a panel of professors who I, I received critique from, and David was one of them, wow. as was Matt Kahn, an, an amazing art professor we had, and Bill Burnett, now the executive director of the product design program, um, and a man named Rolf Fasti, who has since passed away, um, who was at that time the executive director of the program. And so um, those four guys, and another guy, Michael Berry, also would come and give us a, a lot of critique. And so that panel of folks was really formative in, in my experience is becoming a designer. Well, um, so now is the time maybe to, to, to ask you, what, what, what is that? Because um, I find a lot of people use design thinking as kind of a buzzword. Uh, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> that, they don't, that they don't really understand. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like I find myself at odds. Actually, the more the more almost the person talks about design thinking, it's, it's some, sometimes it feels like the less they actually understand it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people who, at least, at least in my environment. Um, and it seems to me that most of the people who actually do get it are from California. Uh, <laughs> so uh, is it, what, how would you define design, design thinking given yeah. this experience? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say, well, first of all, I think design thinking is often misapplied. Um, it's not the solution to every problem, un- unlike the, <laughs> maybe the popular meme. Mm. <laughs> Let's do design thinking. Uh, you know, design thinking at its core is human-centered design, and human-centered design has been a long time, around a long time. So mm. this is not, this is, Stanford didn't invent this process, Stanford didn't invent the idea of designing for people and keeping people at the center of design. Right. Stanford did do a really nice job of, of marketing, frankly, the to design businesses. thinking process. Yeah. yeah, and creating these hexagons that are very memorable. And so just a nice mnemonic about what it is, a nice visual mnemonic. But uh, it, really, it really is this process of putting the user first and trying to understand the user well. Mm-hmm. And so the steps, as you've probably heard them, are empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And 
when people picture it, I think they really picture ID8, right? They picture the thousands of colorful post-its, right. The, right, the, the exuberant brainstorm with candy, um, which is part of the process. But really, it's the first two steps that I think really, that really matter. Um, um, I'll say a little bit more about that. Empathizing and understanding the people that you're designing for, and frankly, designing with is the way that I am starting to think more about it because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, the folks that are uh, in need of whatever this, this product or service that you're thinking about building, um, those people, they know. They know what they do now. They know what they actually need. Um, they have core values that need to be served. And so inviting them into the design process is increasingly key. I think, mm. and especially if you're working on big, wicked problems, um, things about justice, things about climate, things about people are are deeply engaged, not only on a cognitive level, but on an emotional level with these kinds of big problems. And so if you aren't designing with those people, if you're just trying to design for them, save people or convince them, mm. uh, you're never going to get anywhere because yeah. at the end of the day, we're talking about behavior change if we're talking about systemic change. So um, that first step, that empathize step, really getting in, in there with the folks, I think that's critical to good design. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, the, I, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. And, and I imagine you, I mean, as a product designer, you know this, right? You've had, I'm sure, experiences where really having good conversations, shadowing, uh, walking in the shoes of, talking with, inviting into the process have changed products that you've built. Yeah, of course. Um, I I think uh, one of the things I like to say is that the quality of conversation in the beginning determines the quality of the product, and uh, and I mean both the co- the conversation with the end user, but also with the internal team, and being mm-hmm. able to absorb many different points of views and and not run away from them because they don't match your own. Uh, and 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 um, and that's why I'm so excited about sprints. Is is uh, they found a way to kind of structure the conversation in a way that, um, as long as you follow the rules, it's kind of hard for it to go wrong, mm. uh, because it, it relies less on uh, the personal maturity of the participants. Uh, and more on just a structured process to absorb a lot of uh, points of views and then kind of vote on them in, in a way that's, um, there's almost no room for, uh, ego or for, it's just not, you can try to bring it into it, but the process can't support it because we're on, we're on the clock and we have to do the, the next step. Um, and so that's, that's why I'm excited about it. And yeah, and definitely, I think this co-creation and, and empathy is super, super important. Um, and I think that's why having diverse perspectives in the room is so important, just as you said, because if we all have the same views, then whatever our underlying biases, our underlying constraints and assumptions are, we'll just self-reinforce. But yeah. if we have a variety of viewpoints, then there will be challenges that will come out in the wash in that sprint, in that process. Lots of points of view points of view will be aired. And then in that voting process, in the process of dissecting what we've discussed, we will get to something that is unexpected and innovative because all those ideas were present. Exactly. And and we had a sprint recently where um, we had four dominant people, each with a completely different uh, view of what the project even is, um, which is the hardest thing to kind of work out. And, um, And because we follow this process where we actually listen to everybody before we make any decisions, a lot of these tensions that could have continued for months um, got resolved because we kind of, we aired everything out in the beginning and we got alignment in the beginning. Um, So that's super, uh, super, super important. But there's also this aspect of prototyping, right? And testing. There is, there is. And um, and I want to talk about that. I also want to talk about, can we, can we go back to define before we get there? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. because strangely, even after what we've just discussed, I still kind of think at this point, 
in my career, I'm realizing the define step is probably the most important mm. because just as you said about what is this project even about that, that discussion that you had, and then the crystallization of what are we working on? That piece to me is the piece that sets the trajectory for the rest of the, of the process in a, in a really powerful way. And if you frame the question this way versus that way, right? This way, now we're looking over here and this way we're looking over here. And I think that moment of crystallizing around what is it we're trying to do? What, what problem are we trying to solve? How have we verbalized that problem? What is the language we're using? That moment then mm. determines almost the rest of the outcomes. Yeah. Because, you know, if you ask the question one way and then all of your ideas are sort of pushing in one direction and that means that then the thing that you prototype will come out of that idea pool yep. we like to say um that how you frame the question determines the solution space yeah and so that's a great that's a great way of formalizing because it's hard to explain to people why 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 is a single word in the definition of the project can right. matter so much um, so this is actually the best way to describe it that I've heard should that the question defines the, the possibility, the solution space. It really does. And the wording, just as you just said, I feel like that is something that I'm just beginning to get my head around because in diverse rooms, different words mean different things mm. and cult culturally different words mean different things. And depending on the language you're using, you might not even have the words for different things. So there's, there is something about this definition process that is quite thorny and actually quite hard to do well. Hmm. And at the same time, it is in my mind, almost the most important step of all, assuming that you've done good empathy work and that you've gathered a lot of understanding and that you're working with the people who have the problem and all of those things, getting to the point where we know where we're headed, that we have a pointer for the next ideation step, it's tough and yet it's critical. So yeah, yeah I, and the wording part is, uh, uh yeah, I, I have, uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I, I, I'm not expressing that well, but I'm just, I'm really resonating with that, that remark about the, you know, why does one word matter? It does. I understand that's like, I resonate with that so, so much. Um, we have this workshop uh, when we teach design sprints and um, I have this um, example, um, I have this problem that I give to people, which is kind of a fake problem, but that we work together to do a sprint on it. And the uh, and, uh, problem is, you know, I want some sort of digital solution to the rain. I want to be protected from the rain. And, and we interview an expert on rain and uh, and the problems associated with rain in daily life and then we kind of come up with solution and then we define the we try to define the goal for this project and one person writes um you know i i need we need to solve the problem of wet clothes you know after rain like people should not be staying wet clothes and one person says um you know, we should solve the problem of not losing umbrellas uh, or, you know, we should, right? And then another person says, people should learn to love the rain and not be afraid of it. <laughs> and those are completely different companies, completely different products, everything. Right. Um, and, um, it, and so, yeah, I find that uh, the way you phrase it is super, super important. And, and, and it's very kind of... Uh, immediate to me that it's like no you just like look at a couple variations of the goal before you decide right can right. make a, an enormous difference and this is where i think the life design stuff comes in hard because when we're stuck we often frame problems in ways that are difficult for ourselves to solve mm. <laughs> you know it's the you know how can i get promoted and you know that question is about getting a particular position in our current company and maybe there isn't one available and now I'm just banging my head against the wall and I'm mad at my boss who's not promoted me last time and like there's the whole and if we ask the question that way then we get one set of results but if we ask the question how can I become a leader in terms of our product strategy 
which is what the promotion really means in my mind. Mm. But th this is now we're decoupling it from the badge or from some things I can't control what my boss is going to do mm. and moves it into an area that I could potentially take action. How can I start influencing people? How can I learn more about the product direction and start making recommendations? How can I gather data that would support my point of view? How can I present in meetings? How can I lead teams? Right. Now I could do some of that stuff regardless of promotion and it's actionable by me, hmm. but we don't often frame it that way. We don't often step back and do the reframe that allows us to move forward instead. Um, and maybe there's something kind of satisfying too about railing against the universe or about <laughs> against our bosses or whatever the thing is, you know, just from sure. an emotional standpoint. Um, but one of the things we talk about a lot in life design is what's actionable by you. Where can you spend hmm. your energy toward a result that you want to have and a lot of that is in the framing. Yeah. So the framing is the same thing. Is the, the, is the correct usage of language to open the right possibility space. Um, yeah. It's like magic. That's like Harry Potter. Uh, <laughs> if you say the <laughs> right words. <laughs> Um, but it's true. And there's a lot of wand waving that doesn't result in what you want, too. Yeah, I'll yeah. say, I mean, I've framed many a problem incorrectly and then had to realize that through the next steps, right? Through the, the ideation and prototyping, right? That, so, that, that prototyping piece is magical, too, in that it exposes where you screwed up before. Right. <laughs> that's where you know whether you great succeed. knowledge. <laughs> um, yeah. That's awesome. So, so, um, so you had some direct uh, experience with product design and design thinking, and you, you're around all these great people. Um, and then where does the transition to life design happen? Um, and then I'll ask you to define what it even is, but and ask sure. you some hard questions. But uh, yeah, sure. So uh, for me, I went to school as a product designer. And then I dove into um, product consulting. So I worked at IDEO, as I mentioned briefly, and then I worked at a company called D2M for, gosh, I want to say seven or eight years before then working briefly at a medical device startup and then at a big TV startup. And then uh, right around the time of that startup's demise, which was um, unfortunate, but I learned a ton and I actually don't regret any, any part of being part of that company. Mm -hmm. um, I had kids. And so I uh, took some time there to have, uh, to have children and I worked part-time. And during that time, I, I went to an event at Stanford that was celebrating product design as a program. So the program had been in existence for 50 years and there was a celebration of product design as a thing. And during the intervening years of, since I had been a student, uh, they had built the D school uh, back in the day when I was a student that didn't exist. Mm. In fact, product design was sort of the... Um, the redheaded stepchild of the Emmy department who they sort of wanted to shove into the cupboard, like, like Harry Potter under the stairs by the mm. Dursleys, you know, <laughs> like that guy <laughs> or that program. No good. No good. Um, and sort of an embattled program of crazy artists who were somehow sneaking into the engineering department. But the things had changed. And so now the D school was huge. And in fact, uh, the president of, of Stanford had at that point described the D school as one of the three crown jewels of this, of the university. And so it was a completely wow. different landscape. And so they had this big party and they had, you know, folks talk and David Kelly gave a presentation and Bill Burnett was there. And that's so why these were folks that I knew from back when I had been a student and also they had interacted with them professionally in these design consult consulting jobs and startups and so forth. And, and, as this was all unfolding and they were describing the huge expansion of the program, they mentioned that they were going to be teaching, you know, 10 sections of ME 101 and all of this, these grand plans. And so afterward in sort of the cocktail hour, I sidled up to Bill Burnett and I, he was talking to somebody else. So I, I and I kind of was like, Hey, and then I handed him my card and I said, it sounds to me like you're going to need some more instructors. Call me. <laughs> It was like a weird, a weird, a weird sliding of the business card as, as sort of, you know, to try not to interrupt. Nice. And uh, so he did. He called me about, about a year later. He called me and he said, hey, uh, you said you might be interested in teaching. Were you serious? And I said, I said, yes. He said, great. You could do everything from just coming in and delivering a single lecture to running a whole class. Uh, what do you want to do? 
And because I'm not one to go in halfway, I said, I'll run a whole class. <laughs> and so I then had the good fortune to, to team teach uh, with Bill Burnett and another fella, Eli Woolery, who I absolutely adore, who works at Envision now mm. um, and also is still teaching. And the three of us team taught the product design capstone course uh, for seniors developing products and services. And mm. it was fabulous. And I really enjoyed it. And after doing that for a year or two, I asked Bill, who was running the, the program, I said, you know, I'm liking this enough that I think I'd like to do this more as a full-time thing uh, and less as a side hustle. Because at that time, I was working still full-time in software, mm. but I was doing this teaching on the side. And so at that point is the moment of transition between product design and life design, because there wasn't a full-time position available uh, as a product design lecturer. In fact, um, the product design program as a whole really relies on kind of the volunteerism <laughs> of the community to run mm. a lot of the classes. They have a lot of external lectures. But Bill and Dave Evans, so Bill Burnett and Dave Evans, the authors of Designing Your Life, had created this little teaching lab. And they had fellows in this teaching lab. And typically this was grad students that they'd hired out of um, the product design program or out of the uh, school of ed. And he said, well, you know, you can't really, you don't have a PhD. You aren't going to be a tenure track professor here, but we do have this fellowship thing going on. And if you're really serious, um, maybe talk to Dave about, about life design. Hmm. And so I did. And have you heard Dave Evans speak or, or met him? I've heard uh, Bill and Dave speak. Uh, but mostly through YouTube videos. Even I think in a YouTube video, the sheer like crackling energy of Dave Evans probably translates. Mm. Um, he is a six, five, um, like supercharged human. He's just magnetic. And so I had, I had lunch with him and he was telling me about life design and I was just, I was just hooked. And I thought to myself, this makes so much sense. I've been using this product design process, this light, this design thinking process to make goods and services for 25 years. How could I have not thought of this as a process of human development? That's, that's genius. Yeah. <laughs> it, makes, it, it does make a ton of sense. Uh. Yeah. And, and so at that moment I thought, well, then I should do this. And so then I went home and I, I convinced my partner it would be a great idea for me to like make less than half of my salary and go and be a <laughs> fellow at Stanford, don't you think? And he said, okay, um, two years. You had two years. I'm a high school teacher already. You're the breadwinner. <laughs> two years. <laughs> so, so I said, sure, sure, two years. That, that, that's what we'll do. Um, and that was in 2014. So, so uh, a little more than two years. <laughs> Thank goodness for my, my wonderful partner who's willing to allow me to, um, to do this work uh, and to work together to support our family rather than uh, saying, hey, hey, we know really we need you to go back into industry. Mm. Um, teaching, is, um, teaching is so rewarding that I would think that if they, um, if they raise the salaries, nobody would be doing anything else, you know, because <laughs> so it's, it's almost like, um, there's, there's a few jobs that, and this is not for, it's, it's interesting because it's not necessarily glamorous, but it's so satisfying for everyone that my own teaching, but also so many friends who are teachers, there's something fundamentally humanly satisfying about this activity, uh, to the point where, you know, investment bankers leave their jobs to do this. And, you know, people who are in the, losing millions of dollars to do this. Um, so it, it's, um, it's super interesting. So, so I want to ask a couple of hard questions uh, n n as kind of a devil's advocate to, under to, to really get to the bottom of, of uh, life design. So, you know, why, why do we need design tools uh, to choose a career? Why can't we just pick something and go with it? Why, why is it, you know, 
are, are we just designers using the tool we know and insisting that it's the right tool for everything? Why can't we just go to a psychologist and let them say, go do this? Right, take the test that says, right. you know, you should be uh, a whatever. In fact, I took that test in, in high school. I, I, I got baker. I should be a baker, apparently. <laughs> Maybe I should. Um, I don't think there's a right or wrong. I think you could go to a psychologist. And if that worked for you, I think that would be great. Um, and if you took a test and you really resonated with the answer, I think that would also be great. I think that where design thinking is really valuable is if you're stuck. Mm. So if you have tried those things and you, and you aren't getting answers and you're feeling that, geez, I just don't know, then it's a really nice process to sneak up on your future. Mm -hmm. And I like it because it's about building your way forward. It's not the only way to, you know, to solve this problem. And I think that's the flaw in design thinking as it's been sort of popularized is, oh, we should use design thinking. In fact, design thinking is not the right tool if what you're trying to do is efficiently execute it. You've already decided what you're going to do and you just need to execute it. Design thinking, not the tool you need. Design thinking is about trying things, about innovating, about discovering the unknown, um, yeah. really working through ambiguity ambiguous problems. Uh, and it's not for tame problems. It, it, if you've got a tame problem and you've got an equation that you can just apply and solve that problem, then by all means use that equation. Like don't, don't fool around with brainstorming. If what you need to do is figure out the length of the bridge and you know the tensile strengths of steel and you have mm. got a bridge design that you could copy, that would be silly. Just mm. do it. <laughs> but sometimes, and if you, from a life design perspective, if you already know, Hey, I think I want to become a doctor. And the next step is to go to medical school. Um, then by all means, if you're, if you're ready to do that, do it. Uh, the thing is sometimes we have ideas about what something's going to be like that are wrong. <laughs> so the, our process is, well, good, go to medical school. But before you do that, just talk to a couple of people who are in medical school and shadow a doctor for a day so that you're really clear on what it's going to be like mm. and what the end result might feel like to you. And then now you can do that thing that you were going to do with more confidence. Yeah. You have exposed some of the parameters that you're going to be working in and have gathered a little bit more data through felt experience and through resonant conversations with people who are maybe doing the thing you want to do. And now you can charge forward with even greater zeal. Mm, if yeah. that's what happens. So it's the, it's the places of wicked problems and unknown um, yeah. situations or, you know, you know, dealing with the uncertainty of it. Right. So, you know, I, I, going through life in the beginning, when I was, when I was 18, I thought I was, sh I was sure, 100% sure I wanted to write novels. 100% sure. Um, and that didn't turn out to be when I started writing and I actually after years of, of trying realized I really don't like writing that much. I don't like writing fiction that much. Um, and, um, and I meet more and more people who are in their thirties, forties, or even later who are still trying to find the next step or what's the right thing for them or, so why is it why is it so hard? Uh, maybe you 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 probably have a better insight into this than than most people in the world. Why, why is it so hard? Why are why am I in the in my forties? I'm forty. Um, trying to figure out, still still trying to figure out whether to get a PhD or to double down on this company or or to do something or write a book. Like you know, I'm yeah. still thinking about. It. So right. what's, the, what's the core of it? There's no right answer, right? Unlike, unlike engineering where you mm. can solve the problem and then it stays solved, there is no right answer and the conditions are always changing. Mm. And I think this is, the, this is the, the reality that we're living in. First of all, the reality around us is changing all the time. Who could have predicted that I'd be talking to you from my garage? Right. Uh, and so even if I had decided, hey, the, the plan is for me to be a public speaker and to travel the world and do events, <laughs> it wouldn't be happening right now. Even if I had picked that and had mm. decided that that was what I was going to do, the ac external conditions may be such that it, what you had in mind is impossible. Right. Um, and so then we got to change course. And so we need a process to help us change course. And then why is it so hard? 
because change is hard. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I mean, and there is no right answer. And furthermore, there might be multiple right answers, and that might be all simultaneously true. Mm. And holding simultaneous but contradictory truths is something that we as humans are not very good at. That makes sense to me. That makes sense to me because um, I think someone, I think it was a TED talk, I'm trying to remember the name, but um, it was a woman who said uh, the reason hard, hard problems are so hard or hard questions are so hard is that the, is that they're both equally good, but they're just extremely different. Ruth Chang. Yeah. Ruth uh, Chang. Is, okay. We actually use a clip from her TED talk mm. about choices that are on a par and her talk is called hard choices, I believe. And yeah, hard it is a beautiful talk. I recommend it very highly. And one of the things she says in it is the question has to come from inside. Who do you want to become as you make, because there's no right answer. The choices are equally good. Mm. That's why it's a hard choice. If there was a, she, she says it beautifully, I, I, will, I will mangle it, but she says, if, the, if one choice was clearly better than the other, then you would just pick that thing and move on. Right. <laughs> that would be hard. It would be yeah. obviously better. Yeah. Right. And that's not the case. And so what I love about that is, A, it invites some internal reflection. It invites the, the idea of, of growth. Mm. Who am I growing into? So mm. I think that's actually a, a beautiful thing. Mm. Um, but it's also why it's difficult because internal reflection and knowing ourselves is not something that we are trained to spend much time on, especially in the Western world. We are trained to be productive. What are you doing sitting around navel gazing? Come on, let's go. Right. right? Yeah. And so this idea of self-awareness or taking time to slow down and actually understand our own internal landscape. I think that's only recently gained any traction at all. If somebody had said, Oh, you know, try meditation or try some mindfulness practices or try somebody said that to me 20 years ago, I would have laughed at them. Hmm. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's for like gurus and stuff. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. You know, in, in right? <laughs> it, it, think, you know, thinking about that uh, in Thailand, it's, it's, um, it's common for unfortunately, mostly young men, but it's common for young men to spend a couple of months in the monastery before choosing a path in life. Um, and it's completely, it's normal. You go, you volunteer, you, 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 uh, ordain for a couple of months. It's, it's a thing you could become a monk and then unbecome a monk. Um, and they, and, and, and many Thai people say, this is, you know, this is the moment where clarity came because they actually spend time thinking about who they are, what they care about, um, right. so it, it's, it's really interesting. So, so talk about. Um, the life design process yeah. for someone who doesn't know it. What does it look like? What do you, how do you start? What it you start by doing some self-awareness work. So just, we don't have a monastery, so we, we can't actually give people the space uh, in that way. But what our programs and classes do is give people some space and time and some tools to reflect on who they are and what they believe and what they're doing mm. and to try to connect those dots to create a compass for themselves and then using that compass come up with some various ideas and in fact multiple choices that they can put on paper to then evaluate using some criterion that they have themselves decided uh, matter to them and then to recognize that they don't have to go all in on any one of these but that they can dip their toe a little bit to gain confidence and build their way forward. So mm. at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is giving people tools to wayfind, to navigate using some kind of a North star, some kind of understanding of self and understanding of community and their place in community and how they potentially want to have impact. Mm. And then some ways to generate paths forward as they come up against the inevitable roadblocks and in new data. Interesting. And so um, you talk uh so a lot about um, in the life design uh, uh, group lab, uh, talk about mindset and bringing design mindsets to yeah. career, um, career planning. And so can you talk about sure. that a little bit? Yeah. Sure. So it all starts, I think, with curiosity, being open 
like you're a small child uh, to possibility. And that's easier said than done because we're, we're trained from a young age to stop being outlandish, <laughs> mm. <laughs> to, to be realistic. But if you think back to when you were a kid, and I blithely wrote down, I'll be an artist and a scientist, and you perhaps wrote down, I'm going to be a novelist. We, we didn't have any concept of what those things were, but we had absolute confidence that we could do it, mm, <laughs> whatever <sure>. it was. <laughs> right? And, and we were deeply curious about all the things. And if you follow your toddler around, right, they're putting rocks in their mouth and tasting things and touching things. And um, mm. they're engaged in the world in such a way that they're open to possibility. So I think that's where it has to start, is the setting down our past wounds and our history and our all of the things as much as we can and sometimes those things serve us as i mentioned i've got some childhood wounds that maybe inform my empathy but Mm. um and there are systems around us that might potentially be working to block us actively and and we're i think having greater awareness in the u.s Mm. more than than perhaps i wish were the case um that there are truly systems that are holding people back uh, based on their identity. So there's, there are a lot of factors here, but curiosity, the, the, the wonder of, hey, I wonder what's possible is where it maybe begins. Mm. And then framing, right? And reframing. How do we ask the question? How, how, do we, how do we set this up so that we can then come up with new ideas if we're stuck? Mm. And we're assuming that, that that's why we're here, right? If we were just executing along, we wouldn't need design thinking. We would just be out there doing the thing. So um, we're, we're stuck. And so that means we need to think about how do we, how do we voice the problem? How do we set it up? What's the language we use? What's, what is the space into which we want to ideate? Mm. And so you can There's, look at someone, someone's framing of, of the problem for their career. And you say, that's not, that's, that's not quite a productive way of saying it. Is that right? Yeah, or we, or maybe the question is why? Why do you want to do that? What, mm. what, what, tell me more about about what it is about that that appeals to you, mm. and then you start unearthing the maybe some deeper needs or some deeper curiosities that the person has, and then you can ask around those things as opposed to one particular solution. Now we can we can broaden the things that might be available, and so that framing and reframing process is critical mindset. Reframing is a, is a, is both a tool and a way of thinking. Can can we look at this from a different perspective? I think that's very powerful. Cool. The idea of bias to action. Can we try something out? Yeah. Like it's all very well and good to think about it, right? I mean, you had the, like I've been thinking about being a novelist for a long time. And then you started trying it out. I'm going to write. I'm going to write some more. It took a year <laughs> off. Your experience yeah, it took a year off to write and I hated it. <laughs> yeah. So you had that experience, the felt experience of I've tried this thing now and yeah. now I have data that I didn't have before. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. talking about prototyping and then testing. So I think it might not be intuitive to someone who's listening to this, who might be a designer and, and understand prototyping really well, but how can you prototype a career? Yeah. Right. How can you? How can you? <laughs> it's a great question. So we talk about two kinds of prototypes and we talk about life design prototyping. And the first one is prototype conversations. There's somebody out there doing the thing you want to do. Bill likes to use a quote from a science fiction author, William Gibson, which is the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Meaning someone out there is living your future right now. Mm. They're doing the thing. So the first level of prototyping is just go talk to that person and hear their story. Right. And if their description of their day-to-day life and the problems and challenges that they're facing and the things that they're excited about resonates with you and you feel excited, wow, I want to work on those problems and challenges. I want to, you know, do that thing. That's good data. Or if your reaction is, dang, I thought it was going to be this great story. And when you talk about it, it sounds terrible. Even though you're excited about it, I don't know that I want to do that. That's Mm. also data. That's the, re- the recognition that, hmm, I, I don't know. And if you talk to five or six people in the field, now you've got a bunch of perspectives. And if five out of six, it all sounded terrible, right? Then that's, that's information that you didn't have before. Sure. And it's cheap, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I used to say you just cu- takes five cups of coffee or six cups of coffee, right? You go to the Starbucks or the local coffee shop, you buy them a cup of coffee and you hear their story. And what did that cost you? That cost you $30. Mm. 
right? And, and some time. And, Better and some than 30 years. Right, exactly, rather than however many years. So start there, I, I'd say. And then if you're feeling like after those conversations, hey, there's, there's there, there. I think, I think I'm interested in being an office or, or. Then how do you try it in a small way to sort of get a taste, right? So for you, that's like, all right, I'm going to sit down and start writing some short stories or I'm going to start writing a novel. And I'm going to do that for a couple of weeks or a couple months or a couple of years, right? And I'm going to set some trip wires for myself of times to evaluate and notice, hey, how's, how's that going? Mm. Right? And three years is a pretty, that's a pretty big prototype. Like you really, you went all in there. there. Yeah, um, yeah. Right. But, but you may have had some data even after the first few days and, and had some noticings and maybe it's even as small as, Hey, just, just write a blog post, just see what you, what it's like to put writing into the world and then get back a slew of comments, some of which are positive and some of which are negative. Yeah. Right. How does it feel to, to write for the public? And, or what does it even mean to write? You know, just the, I'm just going to write radio jingles for a day you know, <laughs> just to see. I mean, there, there are all these different ways that you could try on in a, in a 24 hour period really spending no money yeah. that could give you some kind of data if you're willing to, to frame it that way. So um, sure. put it experiences, great ways to, to check in on things. When, when we do sprints, we often talk about prototyping as, as lowering the risk to failure, uh, yes. right? And so if I were applying this concept to my own uh, life back in the day, I would say, hey, you know what? Don't quit your job and try to spend a year writing, uh, take a week vacation and try to spend a week writing. And, but really write, like try to write two chapters or try to write. And, uh, and I think I would have probably, uh, or had I been mindful doing that, I could have probably learned the same lessons that I learned over a much longer period of time, which much, with much more cost. Um, so lowering the risk of failure is interesting here. And then the, I guess the other thing with the prototype is that, that it doesn't have to be perfect, right? It, that it, the goal is not to achieve certainty. It's to improve your intuition or your sense of yeah. how it's going to be. Exactly. It's to learn. So in fact, a, a prototype that doesn't work, right? The week of writing where you hated it is just as good a, a bunch of information as a prototype that, uh, that succeeded mm. because what it does is, is give you data to make the next decision. Yeah. And so prototypes have embedded in them an implicit question. Do I like writing? Do I like writing by myself? Do I, you know, just all of those, all of those implicit questions are surfaced. And, mm. and I think that's one of the keys of a good prototype is to really recognize it's an opportunity to learn and to ask yourself, what am I trying to learn by doing this? Am I trying to learn whether I like writing by myself or uh, writing with a, another person? Like if that's the case, then maybe I would try a week writing alone and a week um, collaborating, mm. right? And see kind of how those felt. If, uh, if the question was, do I have good enough ideas to write about? Maybe just the, re the writing alone and realizing, dang, I, I don't have anything to say, right? That would be an interesting, or do I like writing fiction or nonfiction? That might've been a question that, that has come since you now write and you write about other things that are, that are more, um, more about what you do. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, you know, practical. I mean, yeah. It's, it's super interesting. One of the things that I, um, and maybe we'll get to this, but like, um, when I was running a kind of a life design sprint with myself, one of the most useful things I did was I identified, uh, I think it was five or six people that I was really kind of jealous of, like I'm kind of jealous of their career. And I just read their Wikipedia article start to finish about their whole life and how they got to what they're doing today. And, st and I started immediately seeing patterns. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is most of them had a podcast, uh, which is what led to starting. Right. Podcast. Um, they had some, a way to communicate their ideas, uh, which, which I, I think I'm kind of something that I secretly wanted. Um, so it's really, really interesting. So, um, and that connects back to your, to your storytelling and to your novel writing too. Yeah. The communication so. of your, of ideas. How yeah. do I share 
the things that I'm thinking about are the stories I want to tell yeah. with the world. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. It, it just it didn't have to be in story form. It could be in a more direct form. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, one question that I have is you seem to be also focusing a lot on um, uh, workshops for women with the mm -hmm. life design. That's right. Uh, so is there any difference between or any special reason to kind of uh, do a special uh, uh, course for women or special workshop for women besides the obvious distractions that happen when uh, when you mix uh, people? Um, is, that, is there a, a, a difference in the way you approach it? Yeah, there is actually. It's mostly in context. So the tools are the same, but the conversations about the tools are different. Mm -hmm. And I think this would be the case with any affinity group. If you got together folks from a similar cultural background um, or an LGBT workshop or, 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 uh, the felt experience of how we design our lives is informed by our identity. And there are constraints and assumptions that the world places on people based on that identity. And mm -hmm. women have particular assumptions and constraints that have been placed upon them by the cultures in which they live. So if you look at the expectations around caregiving, for example, Mm. The assumption is often, oh, well, the woman will stay home and right. take care of the kids. Oh, the daughter will take care of the aging parents. There are assumptions about behavior. Mm. Women are supposed to be nice. That woman who is really ambitious, mm, you know, we have words for her. Mm. Men, on the other hand, have expectations around, well, maybe you should be the provider Maybe you should be aggressive. Maybe it's okay if you're angry, but it's not if I'm if I am. So there are these different expectations based on who we are. And so the the conversations that we were having with women in co-ed workshops were just different. Susan mm -hmm. and I were noticing we we were in some corporate settings and we were having conversations on the side with women who wanted to talk about some difficult things to talk about in a co-ed work co-ed work environment. Mm -hmm. And we so. realized we need a space to have those conversations, a space where perhaps the experiences aren't all the same, but there is at least an understanding of the water in which we're swimming from the perspective of being a woman in that, in that space. And mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we then talk about our life design given that those realities are true and design around them or design with them or figure out what does that mean to us? What kinds of narratives have we internalized? Do we want to keep those? Do you want to discard them? And that conversation happens very organically when no one has to explain, no, really, it's a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Which, unfortunately, when people have very disparate backgrounds, sometimes we want to say, no, that isn't really your experience because my experience was different. And yeah. unfortunately, at least in our society, men have have long felt that they have the podium <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to, to tell us how it is. <laughs> and so in the absence of that, of, of that voice, then some of the other voices can, um, can really rise and be heard. And I think that's, that was the, the impetus, quite frankly, the, the real impetus of Susan and I starting the designing your life for women workshops was the election in 2016. Mm. We, um, we had done a, a, a pilot with friends and family. It had been pretty successful, but we weren't sure we really wanted to operationalize and, and build a business around it. And then, unfortunately, uh, the election was very shocking mm. to, to both she and I. Sure, um, and the realization that um, we were in a society where openly misogynist behavior was not only not punished, but was in a way kind of swept under the rug or even just sort of laughed off, mm. um, made us realize, wait, we really do want to operate in this space and really start thinking about how we can create opportunities to talk about what it's like to design your life in the world that we're living in right now. That makes a lot of sense to me because I think this, um, these conversations are happening a lot around different groups uh but with the idea of privilege um mm -hmm. you know there's certain problems that you just don't have and so then you're not very eager to talk about them because you don't have them 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think I can definitely see why uh, different social expectations, um, you know, men have more of a permission to be selfish and mm -hmm. more of a permission to say, well, I'm, you know, what's good for me right now in terms of my career? It's, it's, uh, mm -hmm. there's no, I don't know many men who struggled with that piece of it, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, um, it's interesting and, it, and that makes a lot of sense. So thank you for that answer. Um, and, and hopefully you're feeling a lot of satisfaction from the way it's, it's turning, it's turning out now. Uh, cause it seems to be. Yeah, it's been going very well. And I would say this, the, as I mentioned before, the opportunities available now with COVID and the constraints mm -hmm. have really upended what, what we were doing. We were really focused on these in-person events and the opportunity now is to move into the digital space. And so we are about to have our first month-long Designing Your Life journey for women. And we've built a Designing Your Life app that will support ongoing reflection over the course of that month to inform the conversations we have when we have synchronous meetings. So wow. I'm really excited about that. Uh, we've done lots of virtual in terms of synchronous meetings and, and Zooms and, and things like that. And this will be the first time that we've rolled out publicly this app. I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, mm. I think it's going to be great. And I also don't know a, a daily commitment to do something to, to think about what you believe, what you are doing about your life, about your work, about past roles, all of those things those things take a little bit of time and space and carving that out for a weekend, which is what we've done in the past. Uh, it's kind of nicely contained. Mm. If we are now asking you to do it daily, that means you have to carve out a little bit of time each day amidst all of the other pressures and constraints of your life. And so I'll be really curious to see how that feels to mm. folks because consistency over time is something that's hard for humans and life right now is very chaotic and so I'm hoping that it will be a great a moment to sit down and reflect and take a little space. Uh, and it may also be that it's just tough to do. So we'll see. We'll mm. see how it goes. Yeah, I can see it being an anchor that people really gravitate towards and it helps them actually create some order in their lives or that they struggle with it. It could, it could be mm -hmm. that different people have different experiences. Right. right. Um, had a... I've had an, an online, month-long online meditation retreat many years ago that had like a daily commitment uh, to sit and then a couple of meetings. Um, it wasn't every day, but it was a couple of times a week, mm -hmm. a few times a week. But you also had, it came with a daily commitment to sit and meditate for every, every day for at least 30 minutes. Um, and that was... They, it was very nicely wrapped. It was very, it felt like that month kind of stands out as uh, mm. the month I did that. Um, even though it was just Google Meet and, you know, uh, so um, I think there's an opportunity there. I, I, I Good luck with it. I'd love to hear how it, how it goes. And uh, definitely, uh, if you want to give us the dates, then. Uh, we'll Absolutely. It starts the... September 26th. Nice. Uh, it ends October 24th, the, the month. Uh, and then we'll have a, a follow-up meeting a month later to sort of check in again on how it's doing. Cool. Um, and you can find it on Eventbrite. It's Designing Your Life uh, for Women. So you can take a look. Awesome. One month virtual journey. It awesome. is um, an answer in some ways. We were talking about the opportunities and how chat has allowed people to be heard. I think it's an answer in some ways to the fact that sometimes people need more time to let material sink in. And what I love about this format is if you want to spend more time thinking about your odyssey plans and the ideas for your multiple futures, or you really want to sit and write and rewrite your work view or your life view, it gives you the space to do that. And uh, it allows people to process at whatever speed they'd like to process. And in, in, a, in a weekend of packed and you know, we have eight minutes, okay, go. Okay, now we're done. Now we're having a conversation. Um, for some, that is energizing. Yeah. And for others, it's exhausting. And I think this will uh, just allow a little more space. So I'm, I'm actually 
I'm optimistic yeah. that for those who can fit it into their, into their daily routine, that it will actually be really fulfilling and perhaps even more so than a more intense and short-term uh, experience. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I think Seth Godin is famous for doing uh, these longer workshops that are really integrated into your life. Uh, I'm actually thinking about taking one of them because they seem really interesting. But, um, uh, but yeah, cool. So I, I, that, sounds, uh, that sounds like it has a really good chance of being more impactful than something very short and over a weekend and then you're thrown back into your life and, you know, f- return back to your old patterns here. You actually right. have a chance to, to bake that in. Um, super interesting. So um, I guess I want to ask you uh, one final kind of open-ended question uh, about where is this all going? Well, how do you see with the design, with the, with design thinking in general and with life design in particular, what does the future hold? Is this on the rise? Are more people accepting it? And are there any exciting developments that are go- going to happen with this? Um, a- anything that you kind of can project forward, what, what would you like to see? What I'd like to see is everyone having access to tools that help them navigate ambiguity mm. and everyone having communities in which they can have these kinds of conversations if they want them. And that, that sounds really uh, ambitious, yeah. right? The world, the world should have these tools, but I actually think navigating ambiguity is really scary. This is a time right now where mm. ambiguity is, absolutely pummeling us from all sides. Here in California, we've got the pandemic, we have the fires. Um, We are wrestling as a society right now with history of oppression of large numbers of people. And um, and in fact, just human cruelty. So, and worldwide we're seeing, um, we're seeing acts of human cruelty every day. People are, um, are divided and afraid and, um, navigating conditions that often are outside their control. And so the processes that we're talking about um, are potentially a small, I mean, I'm not suggesting that life design is going to change the world, but I think it can change an individual's experience of the yeah. world in a positive way. And so I, I really believe that the, the goal is to try to share this with as many people as are interested in it um, and to help people just face ambiguity with greater resilience and greater confidence that though they don't know what to do, they have a process by which to start. And I think, um, yeah, it, it sounds quite ambitious, but that's what I envision. I envision a way to share this with anybody who wants it. I love that. That's, that's so close to where I would like to contribute, um, you know, is, is giving tools to people to handle these situations in their lives. I think that's part of part of our mission at Remake is is uh, is to think about how to bring this to more people. Uh, so super. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, and since you 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 kind of brought up the individual making a cha- making a, a difference in individual people's lives. Um, I wanted to see if there's any story that comes to mind or any example that's a little bit more concrete about how these tools really open up possibilities, like maybe a story of an individual you don't have to name or something, um, something that will make this real for people. I have actually a really good story and, uh, maybe this will be a chance to share the story of a woman who came to a designing your life for women retreat. Uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. So one of the things that she had been for a long time thinking about was how to have an impact in her community. She cares deeply about the, the area in which she lives. Um, she lives in Carlsbad County uh, in Southern California and was really feeling the need to serve her community better. And in her three Odyssey plans, one of them was uh, included running for office. And when she shared those plans with her, um, with her uh, colleagues at the retreat, she was lit up. She was excited. She cared deeply about the work she was doing. And she was 
um, she was fired up and, and they noticed that and they reflected that back to her. And afterward we debriefed the whole experience and she said, yes, you know, the other women in my triad, they, they mentioned that I was really fired up about this. And we asked her what's stopping you. And she said, well, frankly, the fundraising aspect, I have lots of ideas about policy. I really believe that our community can be well served by doing some particular things, but the idea of raising money for a campaign feels very daunting. Mm. And in that moment, another woman got up and handed her $5 and said, let me be the first to contribute to your campaign. Wow. And so Lena Panagaitis is now running for office in nice. Carlsbad County. Wow. And there was this moment where she realized that she could do this. And she's now doing it. Wow. And I think that's the power of radical collaboration and the, the process of unearthing where you're fired up, where you want to serve your community, and then having people around you affirm affirm you in doing those things. And so I don't know what will happen in November, but I do know that she's going for it and okay. that she has ideas about how to serve her community that she's excited to enact. And that was the moment where she started down that path. Wow. Who knows where that path will take her? Um, I mean, I, my fingers are crossed. I've donated to her campaign, but, uh, it is in those moments where all of a sudden we feel like something is available to us that wasn't available before that I think magic happens. Wow. And in the space that you created that where people have the opportunity of supporting one another and sometimes that's all someone needs is just, I believe in you, go and do it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not alone. Um, it's an amazing story. So, uh, so let's end here and I'll just ask, uh, because this is a great place to end, but I'll just ask, where, where can people find you? Where should they go if they want to find out more? Absolutely. So you can find things about the public workshops at uh, designingyour.life. And if you're interested in women's workshops in particular, you can go backslash women, but there's lots of other stuff there about our co-ed work and also corporate work and facilitating and coaching and all of those things. So please find us there, designingyour.life. And if you're interested in the work that we do at Stanford, the Stanford Life Design Lab is where we're doing that kind of work. So if you're an educator and you're thinking about uh, using this in your school, uh, please find us there, Stanford Life Design Lab. Uh, there are trainings that we run specifically for educators out of the Stanford Lab, and we'd love to have you join the life design community and to use your, these tools with your students. Awesome. And, and all of these links will be in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much, Kathy. I really enjoyed our conversation. My pleasure. All right, that's it for today. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to support it, please consider writing a five-star review in Apple's podcast app or wherever you're listening. It helps many more people discover the podcast and also makes us feel good. Current support for the podcast comes from my own design company, Remake Labs. Uh, we run design sprints all over the world, um, and our goal is to improve outcomes, whether in business or uh, various organizations, through repeated and rapid design interventions. Now, until next time, be well, everyone. See you next week on Remake. Remake.